sister right there. Welcome everyone to our evening service here at Gateway Baptist Church. And as we've done, been doing for the last several months, we are uh, uh, starting out with a, a brief uh, devotional Bible study, and we've been looking into the creation. And we've made it all the way now through the fifth chapter of Genesis. We're about to start into the sixth. And I have uh, taken some time over some of these verses uh, because I want us to uh, to comprehend something that people out in the world, uh, whether they be scholarly people or people who just like to uh, learn all their facts off of YouTube, unfortunately, they don't try to learn any off of my channel. But there are a few facts on there that are moving some good. But... Um, I want to correct something that is commonly believed and it is totally wrong. Uh, right here in Genesis 6, as we begin the chapter, we see some terminology that we don't see anywhere else in the Bible. And there are people who have jumped to some pretty uh, strange conclusions from it. Uh, and all of that is because they don't take the time to examine the Word of God for what it says. They don't take the, the time to investigate the words that are used, the terminology that's used, how it's used, and how it's used in Hebrew literature. That's all important in understanding what the Word of God has to tell us. Now, uh, I'm not saying that, uh, I'm not going to tell you that it says something completely different than it says in the English, because it does not. What you read here is what it says. But what you interpret in your mind from what you read can be something totally and completely different. And so I want us all to get on the same track. I believe uh, a scriptural track, the track that God wants us to be on. Now we looked at verse 1 a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and uh, I made a few comments about it. I didn't say everything I want to say because a lot of it is in verses 2 and 3 and following. So if you look with me in Genesis 6 and, and verse 1, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he... Uh, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sun, after, by the way, that phrase after that, you find that in the New Testament too. After that means immediately after what has already been described. In other words, after that means immediately. Okay? Uh, uh, it's good to understand that. And also, after that, or immediately, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, 
and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I had made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then it goes on to describe the generations of Noah. Uh, there are a couple of other verses below this point that I'm going to refer to. Uh, but as I've said before, this is not going to be an exhaustive study by any means. We're not going to hit everything that's in these verses. We can literally spend months in each one of these chapters. We can spend as long examining one chapter as we've spent so far examining five plus. Uh, and so we're not going to do that. Now, if I were pastor in the church and I had a group of people that, that uh, I had every week and, and they were committed to uh, be here and, and we would do something like that. I've done things like that in the past in my churches. But we're going to, this is an overview study, allowing us to get the essentials out of each chapter so that we have a strong and firm foundation in what we believe and what the Bible says in the very beginning. Because what it says in the beginning is the foundation for the rest of the Bible the other 65 books. So if Genesis is questionable, the whole book is flawed. If Genesis is correct, and we have some godly answers, then we've got hope for the world, for ourselves and for the world, especially in terms of the resurrection, which is based upon the sacrifice of Christ, which is based upon the sacrificial system, which is based by, upon the fact that man is sin. Genesis 3. Paul said that uh, if there is no resurrection, then we of all people are most miserable because we've testified something of God that isn't true, that he raised Jesus from the dead, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise him up. But we have hope in that wonderful statement of Paul because it's based upon the knowledge that he gained from the Word of God beginning in Genesis 1 and moving all the way through. Now, came to pay, I, I want you to see something here. Uh, I've made a, uh, a list highlighting one word, and we're going to get to that here in a minute, but I want you to realize this, that beginning with Adam, Adam was the first, then Eve, they had two children, one of which killed the other, leading to a third named son. These are the named children. They are not the only children of Adam and Eve. There were others, maybe between them, maybe after them, before Seth. But uh, we do know that they had other children because the daughters uh, came from somewhere who became wives for Cain and Seth. Where did they come from? From the same place they came from. They were the children of Adam and Eve. They had to be. There is no other choice. That is all of humanity. Now, from there, we see that there are the generations of Cain and Seth, and I counted nine named generations of Cain, nine named generations of Seth. Now, that may just be for balance, or that may be all that there were at this point. But we do know that uh, Cain and Seth, uh, in their family structure, continued to have children for a long period of time. Uh, they were bearing children for hundreds of years. 
The average lifespan at that time was about 900 years. You can produce a lot of children in 900 years. After the end of about 1,500 years, from the time of creation week, we get to chapter 6 of the book of Genesis. Now, it's only a few pages from Genesis 1-1 to 6-1, but that's 1,500 years thereabout, or 1,600. And in that period of time, it is possible, I believe the other week I meant to say this, and I, I used the wrong uh, uh, multiplier, and I said that it was possible at the time of the flood there were a million people on earth. I meant to say a billion. That's with a B. A billion people on earth. Now, we don't know exactly how many people there were. We do know they were over the face of the whole earth because God condemned mankind over the face of the whole earth and sent a flood over the face of the whole earth. He didn't send local floods periodically, sporadically, as some would have you believe. He sent a flood as a judgment right. upon sin in mankind throughout the entire world. Not the known world, but the entire world. And there is a difference. Now, I want to point this thing out here that uh, could get me in trouble in some circles, but this is not an angelic context. There are no angels in Genesis chapter 6. I'm going to show you something here in a minute. But I just, I wanted to make that statement first. Every, uh, every entity that is named, beginning at the, uh, from chapter 1 of Genesis all through chapter 5, every entity, every uh, personage who is named is a human. Flesh and blood, humanity. In, uh, what's my verse? Luke. Let me read you a verse here. Just so happens it's not on that page, it's on this page. Luke 3.38. And uh, he, he's giving the genealogy here of, of Joseph in the lineage of Christ. When we get to the last verse of the chapter, it says, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. In the book of Luke, Luke, the physician, the, the one who likes to include all the details of reminds us that Adam is called a son of God. Okay? He's the son of God. Because God created him in his own image. So let me suggest something here in the minute or two that I've got left. Everybody that is mentioned here is human, not angelic. Angels are never said to join with human beings and procreate. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ himself said quite the opposite. They neither marry nor are they given in marriage because they're angelic, they're spiritual beings, they're spirit beings, they're not human, they don't have flesh, they don't have the body parts we have, and they don't have the same purpose that you and I have. The Lord Jesus Christ came to save sinners amongst humanity. He didn't come to save the angelic world. There is no salvation for the angelic world. That's reserved for humanity. Why? Because humanity sinned. 
because humanity needs to be brought back to the sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, the sacrifice of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has come in order to be an example to all of us and leave us a path to follow as we trace his steps. To paraphrase Peter. Now, real quickly here. Verse 1. Men began to multiply on the earth. Verse 2. Sons of God and daughters of men. And as we just uh, read or, or just uh, referred to in, in Luke 3, 38, Adam, a total human, is called a son of God. These sons of God are the saintly crowd, uh, which are the descendants of Seth. And the daughters of men. Now he's drawing a distinction here in their character. The sons of God are those who are elevated in spirit because they are following after the word of God. They're following after uh, godly behavior and godly living and a godly creed. The others are on, shown on a lower structure referring to man, which means uh, a soulish individual who is living by his own wits and his own mind and his own determination and not by the word of God or not by uh, the character that God wants to build into mankind. So these two intermingle. That's called compromise. It's not called humanity marrying uh, angels and producing a super race of human beings. There is no such thing. And we're going to cover that next week because I don't have time. Verse 3. God got tired of striving with man. Now notice I'm stressing the word man in all of these. And man has 120 years to repent. The union produced mighty men. Men of renown. Not half man and half God, not half man and half angel. That's Greek and Roman mythology. That's not the Bible. God saw the wickedness of man, verse 5. God repented for making man, verse 6. God determined to destroy man, verse 7. Man, beast, and earth. Then there's a contrast. Man is to be judged, but in verse 8, he found somebody who fit the bill for what he wanted. And Noah found grace in the eyes of God, in the eyes of the Lord. Noah, his wife, their three sons and their wives. Among a billion people in the world, give or take, God found eight righteous and he saved them the world that is the world of man is corrupt verse 11 all the earth is corrupt because of humanity verse 12 mankind has corrupted all the creation where he resides and has care or charge over it verse 13 and so a flood of waters must come to destroy all human flesh. Everything with breath shall die. Verse 17. Now, I don't know if I did an adequate job or not, but it, it is enough to suggest to you that what we're dealing with from beginning to end is humanity. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. I've never seen him anywhere in the New Testament talking to a donkey or a chicken, trying to persuade it to believe and to follow God and to trust him. It's always people, humanity. And that's what we're going to leave it for now.